A comic strip comes to life in this 1990 film from an Oscar-winning director with more colour splashed about than the bedroom walls of a child with Crayola psychosis. Big names and familiar faces in Dick Tracy. With a title like Dick Tracy, long-time viewers and people with a dirty mind may be expecting a video chock full of phallic allusions, genital japes, witty witticisms, double entendre and childish innuendo. I'm up. We will endeavour to stay classy and remain below the John Thomas Johnson Richard threshold for tasteless jokes about Dick Tracy's name. I mean, Dick is an old school term for detective. Tracy, why are we going to the roof? I don't know. Seems like a good place to hide. A big-budget film based on characters originating in a newspaper comic strip wasn't an unheard-of thing, even in 1990. But in the wake of Batman's huge success, hopes were high for Warren Beatty's take on Dick Tracy. Pat, Sam, come in. This is Tracy. I followed her to the Club Ritz. It looks like we got every hood in town in one room. Prune face, flat top, Johnny Ram. Those guys hate each other. Cartoonist Chester Gould created the character of Dick Tracy for a newspaper strip in 1931. Inspired by the likes of Elliot Ness, Dick Tracy was a police detective, though with a name like that there are only two obvious professions, three if you count comic book inkist. Dick Tracy would fight against a variety of unaffiliated gangsters and goons. He had his wristwatch radio and his pals, Pat Patton and Sam Catchem, and of course his best gal, Tess Trueheart. Dick Tracy was one of the most popular newspaper strips for a very long time. Tracy appeared in other media, serials, films, cartoons, etc. But he'd also be a shorthand for a comic strip character. I love to read. Do you? Yeah. Dick Tracy, Flash Gordon mostly. One fan of the character was superstar Warren Beatty. He'd been a leading man in Hollywood for a long time and a notorious hound, but he'd also been working behind the scenes with his first film as producer, Bonnie and Clyde in 1967. He would go on to co-write, produce and direct the film Reds in 1981, for which he won the Academy Award for Best Director. What does a Best Director winner do next? Co-star in the infamous film Ishtar. somewhere along the way he picked up the rights to make a film based on Dick Tracy. Not to be confused with a game played by bored people who only have a lamp, a pencil and tracing paper. I'm rubbing him out. You kill Tracy. They point the finger at me. Police detective Dick Tracy is at the opera with his long-term girlfriend Tess Trueheart when he gets a call on his wrist radio. Shh, turn off your damn phone you dumbass Philistini. Some gangsters have been gunned down, with the only witness an orphan known as The Kid. Dick Tracy and Tess Trueheart, a couple who, depending on which gossip column you read, are either known as True Dick or Dick Hart, take The Kid home with them while they work out what to do with him. I'll be back, big boy. Listen, tell me when you're coming, I'll have a big party. Meanwhile, gangster big boy Caprice has taken over the nightclub of Lips Manless disposing of Lips in a concrete puffer jacket, while also claiming ownership of Lips's dame, the singer Breathless Mahoney. I get sick when you eat. You didn't use to. You didn't used to be a zuckling. There's a bit of a love triangle where Breathless has a thing for Dick. Tracy and Dick is Mahoney curious, while Tess, after 25 years, is starting to suspect Tracy of not being entirely ready to commit to her. See, if you were not in the street every night risking your neck, you could have a wife. I mean, a life. The film shows Tracy as a major thorn in Caprice's side, and so Big Boy sets out to frame Dick Tracy for the murder of the corrupt district attorney. I mean, what sort of monster would shoot Dick Van Dyke? I mean, surely by now the UK had forgiven him for his accent in Mary Poppins. Uh -huh. I am sorry. Dick Tracy is disgraced, or disgraced while Big Boy's takeover of the city gathers momentum. One teeny tiny wrinkle in all of this is the shadowy figure known as The Blank, showing up here and there to put a spanner in the works of Big Boy's plans for domination. Meet me at the city car barn in one hour. Towards the end of the film, things start to get a little messy, but basically Tess was kidnapped to incriminate Big Boy, but Big Boy kidnaps her anyway before Tracy tracks them down, then The Blank shows up just to complicate things. The kid, now going by the name Dick Tracy Jr., helps out. Big Boy falls to his doom, while the blank turns out to be, what the hell? It was breathless all along. 
and she would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that damn kid. I want Dick Tracy dead! The Dick Tracy newspaper strip generally consisted of between 8 and 12 panels at a time, and that style of narrative seems to be replicated in many aspects of the film's presentation. There's a story that seems to be made up as it goes along, short and occasionally abrupt scenes where it feels like we're getting the bare minimum of plot in order to keep the film going, several montages, I mean a lot of montages. It is sometimes like watching an end of year highlights package but skipping every second month. Well if you want that detective certificate to be permanent you gotta pick a name. <laughs> Gimme. The film is mostly fun but even with a short runtime gets close to outstaying its welcome. Police brutality boys and this is the fifth time. Dick Tracy was known for its rogues gallery and many of them appear in the film, even if for just one scene. The film is full of colourful gangsters, sometimes played by well-known actors and often in grotesque makeup. There's Little Face, Flat Top, Lips, Mumbles, Itchy, The Influence, The Stooge, The Rodent, The Brow, Numbers, Texy Grace, Prune Face, 88 Keys, Spud. Not shown are these crooks that I may have just made up, Double Dip, Butt Crack and Edith P.F. Tracy's longtime allies Pat Patton and Sam Ketchum are there just, but the film is Beatty's in so many ways. His version of Dick Tracy isn't a particularly deep character. Hey copper, maybe you want to look before you leap, huh? We got rights. Take the bad men away, they scare me. He's dedicated to his job, sort of dedicated to his girlfriend, and starts off quite ambivalent towards adopting a kid. He's not somebody who can communicate emotions all that easily, though he's clearly trying very hard to remember that he's actually spoken for when dealing with Breathless. Glenn Headley as Tess Trueheart gives us a put-upon girlfriend who has to play second fiddle to Dick's job. When you play in the street, it's part of the game, I know that. You just don't ask me to like it. 1990 was a year where Al Pacino played two incredibly different takes on a crime boss. Who's to say which role was more over the top? Was it this? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Or this? You're not out. You're not out. When you are dead, then you are out. You are mine. I own you. No, actually, it's this. Big boy huffs and puffs, smacks Madonna around, has people killed, confesses his love for Tess while also threatening her life. I'm having a thought. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's gone. It's fairly entertaining and a prelude to 90s Pacino canon where he would overact portraying some incredibly obnoxious characters. All's fair in love and business. Pop star Madonna, an occasional actress, manages to not be terrible as a singer sweet on Dick. Tracy, and who also turns out to be a killer. No grief for lips. I'm wearing black underwear. Though that ends up being a bit confusing. She spends much of the film trying to seduce Tracy, uh, then she frames him, and then she saves him. You gotta tell him everything. The acting is solid, even if the film doesn't really give many characters much of anything to chew on. Oh, come on now, that doesn't count. Hello, big boy. Some cast members are saddled with 30 style dialogue, hard to deliver with a totally straight face, but this cast, often encased in layers of latex, do okay. We don't want no kid copper. Yeah, we don't want no kid copper. If pressed, I'd say Pacino's possibly the worst offender, going hammier than a club sandwich with extra ham. Beatty's co-star from Ishtar, Dustin Hoffman, as Mumbles comes close to stealing every scene he's in. What do you think, Mumbles? Dick Tracy has some really nice production design and art direction. Everything uses seven colours, nicely echoing the source material. It looks almost purely like a live action version of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Unlike so many films from the era, it's bright, it's colourful and there's contrast to the image. Celebrated cinematographer Vittorio Storato gave us a visually lush film in an era where film stock and lighting often left movies looking a little flat and dim. On the other hand, you could also argue that the colourful sets and clothes make parts of the film look like a 1990s Nickelodeon series for kids, What's in Big Boy's Pants? 
There are lots of special effects from mats, process shots, wipes, and it ties together very nicely. Visually, it's a film that's very nice to look at. Not remotely realistic, but that was never the intention. Composer Danny Elfman wrote a suitably epic score for a soundtrack rounded out with a few songs from Stephen Sondheim, which were sung well enough by Madonna. It's certainly a film dripping with style, even if it seems like the style took precedence over substance. The script was from writers Jim Cash and Jack Epps Jr., the duo behind the script for Top Gun. Here, Tracy's less Top Gun, more Top Gum Shoe. While you could say parts of this film were influenced by Tim Burton's Batman, realistically the film had been in the works for a while and principal photography had already wrapped before Keaton's first appearance as Batman premiered in theatres. The marketing for Dick Tracy did take a leaf out of Batman's playbook. Madonna released an album, I'm Breathless, alongside the film, featuring a few of Stephen Sondheim's songs from the film, as well as Madonna's own tunes inspired by elements of the film, including Hanky Panky and mega hit Vogue. Madonna also dated Beatty for a time around the making of the film, but at the time an actress dating Warren Beatty was almost as cliched as a video about Dick Tracy constantly dropping penis puns. Oops, what a giveaway. The film's trailer seemed to show every shot of Madonna in the film and yet feature very little of Beatty, which perhaps showed who the promo people thought was the bigger box office drawer in 1990. Dick Tracy is a fun enough time in the first hour, but the final act starts to unravel like Auntie Beryl's web of lies in court as to why the bloody knife has her fingerprints on it, which is weird because we were only playing Clue. In trying to tie up the loose ends, there's a really, really big machine gun battle, which sees whoever wasn't needed for the final battle popping off Tommy guns. Much of the rogues gallery get quietly off in this one scene. Obviously none had a contract for a sequel, possibly seeing Dick Tracy visit Australia, and it may have even been called Dick Tracy 2, Down Under Dick. A Dick Tracy film had been in development for years with various combinations of studios, directors and stars, including Beatty at one point. It eventually ended up at Disney, who after decades of only producing G-rated films, had started to branch out with their Touchstone label as a way to brand PG-13 and R-rated films, yet not harm the Disney brand. Even as a PG-rated film, Dick Tracy would eventually be released with the Touchstone branding. With Beatty attached to direct as well as star, Disney was wary of the reputation of his films for escalating costs, so contracts were written in a way to make cost overruns the responsibility of Beatty. Would you like a broken arm? Even so, the film's budget grew larger than the original $30 million budget. The movie on release in summer 1990 did well, Almost to the point you'd call it a hit, but for the movie's backers, it wasn't a mega hit. It wasn't Batman money. It's like winning a lottery jackpot, but being incredibly disappointed when you learn it's only the fourth biggest jackpot prize of all time. Reviews for this film were okay, so the project was never considered a complete critical disaster, on the level of some other live-action comic strip adaptations like Howard the Duck or Robert Altman's Popeye. Beatty pushed forward with plans for a sequel, but ongoing legal disputes prevented a sequel being made and scuppered other efforts to create more Dick Tracy live-action adventures. Tried the iodine transfer? Yes, Tracy. The silver nitrate? Twice. Big boy Caprice's fingerprints are not on those walnuts, Tracy. Yes, what? The film just about manages to not outstay its welcome. I mean, just. It is touch and go. I've thought about the point where Dick Tracy loses the viewer. What is this? It's Tracy Stay! What's he doing? It's around this point that you have soaked up all of the interesting things the film has to offer, and then that's it. The film has nothing new for you. No! No! That's wrong! That's off! That's wrong! It doesn't work! It's not good! Beautiful cinematography, great makeup effects, nice costumes, a good cast, but the script doesn't attempt to do anything other than mimic a long-running comic and the early years of that. By the time the film had been made, Dick Tracy and the comics had hovering trash cans, the hero had regularly traveled to and from the moon, and he grew a mustache. Seriously, what's with the mustache? I'd seen the film on its original release in the cinema, where I thought it was okay, but was nothing amazing, and promptly forgot about it. Just like one would forget about checking the air in your tires, or scanning absolutely every tin of tuna at the self-serve checkout. Call me pedantic, but I expected far better grammar and punctuation from 1930s style gangsters. Then it don't work. Big boy, ain't we pals? Flat Top in particular wastes around 700 rounds of ammunition to leave a message for Dick Tracy, yet he could have at least used another half a clip for a comma. Thank you. Watching Dick Tracy again, I liked it enough for the first hour. 
the visuals do draw you in somewhat and you probably hope that the rest of the film is going to be as good. But in the end, it's just a decent time rather than a grand one. It's certainly stylish, but has as much substance as a jar of air. Unless you really like this version of Dick Tracy, it's not necessarily a film most people will want to watch again and again. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. Are the enemy of my friend, my enemy. What? Are the enemy of my enemy, my enemy. What did he say? The enemy of my enemy is my enemy.